I was born on November 9, 1938, in Lewiston, Maine. My father was a French-Canadian handyman, mechanic, and plumber. When I was seven years old, he decided to move our family from Maine to California. As a child, I couldn't speak English that fluently and spent most of my time in Griffith Park, Burbank, where I had managed to build a bow and arrow and used it to hunt animals. Welcome to Business Breakdowns, the channel where we break down the stories of the most successful companies in the world. If you enjoy this video, please hit the like and subscribe button so more people can hear stories like these. As I grew up, I had become fascinated by climbing, but unfortunately at the time, the sport was not as well developed in America. So I joined the next best thing, a local falconry club, where they rappelled down the side of cliffs in search of falcon nests. With years of practice, my friends and I were ready to embark on our own adventures across America to rappel down rocks. Climbing had not only become my passion, but also a way of living. Over time, I realized that the equipment used to climb the rocks was actually harming them, and this made me environmentally conscious. So, I decided to make my own climbing equipment to prevent further damage. Soon as more and more people became aware of the situation, they were interested in buying custom-made pitons, metal spikes used in climbing. I sold them at the rate of $1.50 each and used the money to make a living. I continued my travels, climbed rocks by day and forged pitons by night. I get all my good ideas outside on how to improve the gear or a different technique. When I was making all the climbing gear, it was a labor of love and I was hardly making any money of it. My passion took me rock climbing across the world. One of the trips took me to Scotland in 1970 for a winter climb. This was the one that changed my life. Before my trip to Edinburgh, I stumbled upon a rugby shirt at a sports store and realized that it would be great for climbing. The rugged and reinforced material wouldn't rip. While in Scotland, all my friends were highly impressed with this rugby shirt. Everything about it, even the collars which prevented the hardware slings from cutting into my neck, seemed perfect for climbing. From then on, I decided to wear it for all my climbs, and to my surprise, it created a fashion trend among climbers. This rugby jersey was high in demand, and I seized the opportunity and decided to make the best of it. We had to have quality in our mind while building gear, because it could kill somebody. And in fact, we were our own users, so if we messed up, it could kill one of us. This work ethic transferred to our clothing line, because I didn't want to lower those standards. The jerseys were selling like hotcakes. It was an instant success, and to keep up with the demand, I had to place orders from England, New Zealand, and Argentina. By 1972, I expanded further and was now selling rain kugels and bivouac sacks from Scotland, boiled wool gloves and mittens from Austria, and hand-knit reversible schizo hats from Boulder. As the clothing side of the business outgrew the equipment business, I decided that it needed its own unique identity. And so, in 1973, Patagonia was born. I felt the name brings to mind romantic visions of glaciers tumbling into fjords, jagged windswept peaks, gauchos, and condors. It all began with the idea of starting with the principles of industrial design rather than fashion design. Fashion design starts with wrapping some cloth around a mannequin, pinning it here and there, and you come up with a creation. Whereas in industrial design, you come up with a functional need that you have to solve, and that's my approach to making clothing. And honestly, that's been the secret of our success. At Patagonia, my main focus was to perfect our craft, be it our materials or the effect we have on the environment. A lot of effort and research was put in on these factors. Initially, when we opened our store in Boston, some of the employees were complaining of a headache. So I immediately closed the store and called in a chemical engineer, who said it was caused by the lack of ventilation and the use of a poisonous chemical, formaldehyde, put on cotton to avoid shrinkage. This completely shocked me, and I did not just want to improve the ventilation, but also decided to get rid of using harmful substances while producing my clothes to begin with. 
Patagonia was one of the first companies to start using organically grown cotton. It was a cost I was willing to take and even one of the main reasons for the high price of our clothes. I started thinking about what we were doing and how it affects the environment. And that's when we started asking questions and over the years, we've asked enough questions that we cleaned up our entire supply chain. It is more expensive to do that, but as it turns out, our customers really appreciate that we're doing all the work for them. We are an anti-consumerist and pro-environment company who have a very minimalistic approach to advertising. One of our most popular ad campaigns was a picture of our best-selling jacket and a bold text saying, don't buy this jacket. This campaign turned out very successful and further increased our sales. That being said, it put my company into a lot of controversies. People started thinking that this advertisement was just a gimmick to increase sales for the company and that we are not truly concerned about the environment. If we take a closer look at that campaign, the purpose of the ad was to inform our customers to not buy multiple clothing items if not necessary, as the environmental cost of one jacket outweighs the consumer cost of the product. The message was to try to sustain with the clothes one has and not just buy items blindly. I'm not in business to grow a large business. I'm not in business to get richer or be a big shot. I'm very pessimistic about the fate of the planet and I use business to try and influence other companies to be more responsible. And so, I didn't stop there. Since April 2017, certain Patagonia merchandise that is in good condition can be returned for new merchandise credits. The used merchandise gets cleaned and repaired and sold on our Worn Wear website. As part of the Worn Wear campaign, we constructed a purpose-built truck to travel around America and repair clothes on the move. The converted biodiesel truck was kitted out with industrial sewing machines with two of our seamstresses on board for the journey. This turned out to be a huge step in the right direction for my company. And today, we are one of the world's leading environmentally friendly clothing brands. I'm trying to simplify my life as much as I can. I've learned from sports that when you become a really great climber, you don't need a rope. In fact, you can just solo it. My name is Yvonne Chenard, and I am the founder of Patagonia. If you guys liked that video, please hit the like button. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm. Just the research and the editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could check out our Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can support our work. Um, we produce over like 12 videos per month, so that's literally 8 cents per video. Thanks so much guys. Peace out.